Hi, I'm Phil Potloff, Head of Enterprise Strategy for AWS. And I'm Ben Kehoe, Cloud Robotics Research Scientist at iRobot and an AWS Serverless Hero. And we're here today with Justin. I'm Justin Broadley, VP of Cloud at LMA. Today we're going to be talking about application modernization and specifically how serverless technologies are influencing new architectures. So before we get started, uh, I'd like to hear from both of you guys. Uh, when we talk about serverless technologies, our CTO, Werner Vogels, often says that there are common patterns across modern applications. Uh, and what, what specifically with serverless are the key elements of a modern application architecture? Yeah, I think the key thing is being able to drive innovation and start focusing on the business values much faster. Take out that infrastructure component from the story, uh, focus on security, the business value, and really driving that part of the business uh, home at the end of the day. Ben? I completely agree. I think uh, that focus on business value, uh, ceasing to need to solve technology problems in order to solve business problems, and um, choosing technologies around how they enable you to focus better. Got it. So Justin, um, on that front, when you started adopting serverless technologies as part of your refactoring or modernization uh, of your infrastructure and applications, uh, was it a business value decision or were there other factors around performance scalability that were key, key factors? Yeah, I mean, LMA is going through a very large cloud transformation. And so one of our very first applications focused very heavily on Lambda as a way to enable the business very quickly. And so instead of building out a very complicated API gateway solution, um, potentially using competitive products, we partnered with API Gateway and Lambda and were able to go to market within six to eight months um, versus what we thought would be a multiple year project. So for us, Lambda has been a huge enabler of innovation. We've been able to really drive our story forward for all of our new products, uh, anything from static web applications using Lambda in the background uh, to things like Dynamo and other serverless technologies are really great for us. Got it, and, and also for, uh, that's for new technologies and for existing technologies, are you uh, decomposing your existing monoliths and, and other large applications with serverless as well? Yeah, so it's traditionally the applications, you know, older. It's about 15 years of architecture history, and it's being modernized into a web application. Um, and a lot of those technology choices are built around becoming web-enabled on Lambda, web-enabled on containerization, um, and really breaking that monolith up into the microservices that make sense for our business. Um, that's an evolutionary process, and it's taking a while to do that. Well, your, your North Star uh, as a company is to automate yes. everything in the mortgage industry, right? So I imagine that you have a lot of uh, use cases. To yes, work. I mean, automate everything in mortgage, automate everything in our infrastructure and automate everything in our app delivery is really where we're trying to go at this point. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a big part of everything we want to do is simplify our infrastructure and get our innovation out to our customers to reduce costs and make themselves more efficient. How far into your journey are you? So we're a few years into our journey and we still have a little ways to go. Um, any cloud journey and tra cloud transformation takes a lot. Um, you know, especially since we didn't really focus on lift and shift as our primary, we really we did want to refactor on Lambda and containerization. And so that takes a little bit longer. Um, and that's really what our business drivers are at this point, is really getting that modernization, better stability, better performance, uh, and much happier customers at the end of the day. Did it take any internal convincing to not lift and shift and to choose modernization of your architecture? architecture? No, luckily our, you know, our motto again being automate everything, automatable mortgage, um, you know, the need to do it right and to do the right things for our customers is super important. Um, we process over 40% of the mortgages in the United States. Um, and so if you're sitting at that door, you know, at the desk signing papers to get into your new house, um, you want to be able to do that. And so being able to do that with a system that's automatable, scalable, efficient, and, you know, simple is really the right thing to do for us. So one of the things that's interesting uh, in my former company, when we first started adopting serverless technologies, we actually started to see that other components of the stack, uh, like data stores, uh, were not kind of weren't matching the cycle time or development time that we were getting out of our serverless applications. Have you seen that as well? And are you making adjustments across the stack to accommodate that? Yeah, so the data silo is interesting because monopoly, you know, uh, if you think about a monolithic application as a whole, um, you typically have also a monolithic database structure. And so you have to start really thinking about decomposing those components into the individual microservices. And so we have started to see microservices now building their own data layers on top of things like Postgres and Aurora Postgres um, to really help start setting that stage. But bringing down a monolithic database of a size is a little bit of work. <laughs> so that's a, we're just at the very infancy of that part of our journey. Yeah, so what are some other services beyond Aurora and the data services that you're using? 
Uh, we pretty much use everything uh, Amazon offers um, in the main compute space. So from EC2 instances to ECS for containerization, Lambda, um, you know, Dynamo, Redshift, everything is kind of in place somewhere in our company. We really embrace a polyglot type architecture when we first moved to cloud to really help you know, jumpstart that beginning st uh, stages of our migration. Because traditionally we were .NET shop and we really thought we could make more innovation happen by moving into a more Java-based company. And how do you evangelize that serverless mindset inside your company? So there, there must be teams who are, you know, more bought in to very AWS service heavy architectures mm -hmm. and ones that, that, that want to stay more in the traditional world. How do you help those teams move forward? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, our teams, when they started out, you know, adopted Lambda for API Gateway very quickly. Um, they started seeing success there very quickly. Other teams kind of started to look at it a little bit, but then, you know, certain things don't work the way you expect them to when you first jump into serverless and you don't think about event driven the right way. You don't think about uh, changing the way you design apps. Um, we kind of took a little bit of a step back and we kind of really started focusing more on infrastructure automation and really what I call Lambda Spackle. Uh, you know, filling in those, those gaps in the infrastructure where we really needed to fix security. Um, and so we had a lot of tremendous success around Lambda in that area. And that success has now begotten other teams moving into the Lambda in a much bigger way. And seeing that success has driven that in a big, big benefit. Yeah. And so uh, often, you know, Conway's law is very important, um, like where your architecture is just always going to match your org structure. When you're building differently on Lambda, has that required you to uh, rethink some of the organizational pieces? Yeah, we've had to rethink um, how we approach things like APIs and how we uh, you know, build out our platform services to really take advantage of serverless in the right ways. And we've done iterative processes to kind of move our organization in the right direction because you can't just go in and change an entire organization <laughs> overnight and have success there. It's too much disruption, too much storming and forming. Um, and so we've ev evolved over the last three years really to get the right architecture and the right team structure to help support that architecture. So Justin, I want to go back to something that, that Ben had asked earlier, which was around uh, bringing serverless into your environment. Because one of the questions that I get all the time from companies adopting cloud-native technologies is, what's the right model? Is it centralized command and control, develop patterns, and then push those out? Or is it to really decentralize uh, and allow teams to be able to have the freedom and governance to experiment independently? And what, what's, what have you found to be the best mode of adoption for, in your organization for you, our cloud native architecture? Yeah, so I think it's a bit of both. Um, I think if you spend too much time trying to get the scaffolding right, trying to get the guardrails right, you know, you're two years down to a plan and now you're firing your DevOps team because they haven't delivered anything on the cloud migration. Um, I think if you're talking about, you know, wild, wild west and there's no controls, you're in a whole different problem where you don't get the stability, you don't get the innovation, you don't get the cost optimizations you want. So I think you need to do both at the same time. And so we really took a, that perspective. We built out our guardrails very early on. Um, we built out, you know, very early proof points on top of containers and Lambda to show that we could do it. And we started releasing products um, within the first year of our journey um, to make sure we could get those proof points in the space um, as fast as possible. And that way we got the mixture of security, compliance, and productivity out of it. What, what do those guardrails look like? Yeah, so we built um, an entire remediation framework around Lambda. So if an engineer comes in um, and let's say they open up a security group to the internet, it shouldn't be port 22, being a classic example of that. Um, we actually have Lambda functions that come through every 20 minutes and basically de detect that and actually fix that issue. Um, and we use that across over 180 accounts today um, as we're a very large multi-account strategy division. Um, and so we built over 160 remediations now on top of Lambda to really double drive that guardrail. And now we're starting to pull those guardrails out of you know, the detect side and move them into the prevent side. Um, but it's the right balance of both protect and prevent to make sure we do the right things for our customers. So the CISO buys you a great Christmas gift because you've solved their hardest problem, right? We like to think so. <laughs> you mentioned a bit of, of uh, having built something and finding out that you didn't build it in the right way. What effect did that have on adoption and yeah. on how you think about uh, what's necessary to build serverless in an organization? Yeah, so when you go into an application that is traditionally more of a listener type application and it's not event driven, um, you start seeing that uh, your applications get the latency that it needs. It has delays in performance. It, you know, cold starts are impacting you in a way you don't expect. Um, and so in our organization, it ended up becoming a product that kind of failed. And so then the architecture team kind of says, well, Lambda's not right for us. Um, 
And we're like, well, no, but Lambda has a lot of value to us as a company anyways. And so even though it didn't work for this use case, we need to start thinking differently about how we design our applications. And it's interesting because in the last year and a half or so, we really started to adopt Kafka in a big way and really start driving event-driven data structures on that side. Um, and with that transition now, we're kind of coming back to Lambda as being a really great solution for that use case. Um, as well as we've had a great success um, in very traditional, you know, taking an office document, parsing text out of it, and, and which would be typically in a Word SDK, now moving that into Lambda, and we're getting much faster performance out of that type of, of system using Lambda. So we're seeing those proof points now that really drive the adoption of Lambda in a big way that we didn't have, you know, two years ago when we didn't quite know what we were doing yet. Uh, so one of the main uh, themes of resistance that people have uh, when they encounter serverless is vendor lock-in. How do you think about vendor lock-in and the choice to adopt serverless on AWS? Yeah, you know, I think about lock-in and the fact that every choice we make as technologists is lock-in. Either it be you chose Java or you chose .NET, you chose Oracle, you chose MS SQL um, or MySQL. Those are all decisions you're making and those are technical debts that you are going to incur over time. And when you want to change those platforms, it's, it's sometimes difficult and costly and painful. Making a choice to go cloud native uh, with Amazon Lambda or something like that is that same choice. And I think in the advantage that we have here is that because we're using common language frameworks in top of Lambda, that it actually isn't that much lock-in. It's not that hard to take a Lambda function that isn't working as a Lambda function and move it to a container if we really had to. And it's not so hard to go from container back to Lambda. So while there is a lock-in of what Lambda is, um, there's really not a lock-in from the day of like, it's not gonna take us six months to move off of that platform if we had to. And so that lock-in is much more valuable to us because the innovation enhancement we get is much better. So you mentioned that you've got a mix of both functions and containers. How do you decide which tool to apply to any given situation? Yeah, it's um, interesting. So typically, if we're dealing with event-driven uh, data that's coming into our system, we can put that into Lambda pretty easily. A lot of times in the mortgage space, we're talking about documents and things that manage state, uh, and that state has to be maintained over time. So typically, if we're dealing with applications that require state, we push those into containers um, or long-running queries that kind of go over that 15-minute window. And we do a lot of data processing, a lot of document conversion, if you think about it, um, just in the matter of taking you know, a W-2 or a tax return and then turning that into PDFs and all the different documentation for a loan. Um, those are really long-running processes mm -hmm. many times. And so those are not good use cases for Lambda today, and maybe they will be in the future, but now uh, we really try to focus those APIs where it makes the most sense based on state. So Justin and Ben, you're both in your roles kind of pushing the, the boundaries on Lambda, and you know it never ceases to amaze me seeing how customers have moved beyond the original thinking of Lambda as an event-driven use case. Uh, and really adopted it in pretty much anything you can imagine. What, what's the most interesting use case you've seen of serverless and Lambda specifically? Sure, so we, um, we built a cloud formation to build a Lambda that then did a bunch of work and then deleted itself out of the Lambda cloud formation. So it was a super fun uh, little experiment we did that was uh, pretty fun. Uh, but then, you know, there's so many great solutions out there on the internet and people are like Ben and tech teams are doing amazing work with Lambda. Um, and I'm always impressed with what people are doing and the, the new ideas they come up with. I mean, the remediations that we do alone are really impressive. You know, attaching, having a Lambda that runs to attach a Lambda to a different log group. I mean, like we're doing, you know, updating Lambda layers from one Lambda to another. For me, I think the, the sort of craziest serverless things I see is when, is when people build something that isn't available as a managed service yet. And so they, they figure out how to build a Rube Goldberg machine to uh, wire a bunch of Lambdas and things together to accomplish it. But then once there's a managed service, you get to throw that entirely away. Mm -hmm. And the people who are really bought into serverless are always happy to throw things away that they've built because it means that they don't have to run it anymore. Yep. So on that front, I have one last question for you, Justin. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, customers really value the, the, the notion that you can have this ephemeral compute and you're only using it for the scale of the application need. And I wonder, uh, beyond that, what, what are, you know, in the use that you've had of Lambda and serverless, what do you see as kind of the business value in operating this new paradigm? Well, I mean, if you take the what it would take to run an API gateway of some size, right, and you talk about the number of containers, the API gateway infrastructure, the EC2 compute of that, that's a tremendously expensive, multi-tenant, multi-regional architecture um, that when we move it into Lambda and we look at it just from the event-driven side, that be, the costs become fractions. And so, you know, it's a, it's a much better story for us to be able to move a service into Lambda and be able to get that dynamic elasticity without having to think about those EC2 instances, without having to maintain them, and ha 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 sorry, without having to patch them. That it's a really huge value for us at the end of the day that makes Lambda really attractive. Well, Justin, Ben, this has been great. Thanks a lot for sharing your experience. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been really awesome. Thank you for watching.